Welcome you to the second study tonight on the cycle of victorious living by Oli. And we're going to be looking at commit tonight. And this is based on Psalm 37. So if you want Psalm 37 to keep it handy with you, your Bible as you look at it, it, it will help you. So let's go again to, um, to the video. We'll look at that. And then we will go into a time of study. Let's just open in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us tonight and thank you that, that you are so gracious and so special towards us. Thank you for Robin and Jack that are with us tonight. We thank you for your touch on Robin, Lord. We continue praying for Camilla, Lord, that you will just continue healing her. We pray for, um, for Roger and Paula, Lord, that you'll be with them and be with Paula at this time especially. We ask this in Jesus' name. Great for Tammy too. Good evening, Home World Nazarenes. Welcome Wednesday. Uh, last week we began the study uh, out of uh, Earl Lee, Dr. Earl Lee's book, the, Bo the Cycle of Victorious Living. And if you remember, uh, the intro chapter was about not fretting out of Psalm 37, where it says, Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong, for like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. A little later in this same psalm, it talks about not fretting again. In verse 8, refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. Well, tonight we're going to uh, look at chapter 2 for our devotional. And Dr. Lee uh, entitled it, Commit, Thank you. Hands Down. And uh, he's basing this chapter on verse 5 of Psalm 37. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. He writes this, True commitment means we wash our hands of ourselves and give to Him our all, totally, not on condition. When conditions are attached, our palms are held upward. But deep commitment means our palms are down. It is the only way to enter the cycle of victorious living. It demands faith in the character of our God, and not in the circumstances we see or understand that we find ourselves in. He goes on and he says, as we've already stated, commitment is not only initial, it is continuous. We are human beings. We face new situations constantly. And over and over, new problems are fed into the cycle. But the process, once learned, becomes a glorious way of life. New light comes and specific areas are dealt with. You never arrive or cease to learn and apply principles of victory. This is practical, sanctified living. And then he gives this illustration. He talks about a, a man who uh, experienced a terrible earthquake uh, back in the 60s. And the man writes about his experience. He had been a person who was part of a band who played the trumpet, and he loved playing his trumpet. And uh, he says that uh, earthquakes were pretty common where he lived, and they were used to minor earthquakes, and every once in a while a tremor here and there, and maybe something would, would uh, shake in the house. But on this particular day, it became obvious to him that this was the real thing, the big one. And uh, he said, uh, I... I turned into the driveway and watched my house swerve and groan as though in mortal agony. It was though someone had engaged in a gigantic taffy pole, stretching it, shrinking and twisting it. I became aware of tall trees falling in our yard, so I moved to a spot that I thought would be safe. But as I moved, I saw cracks appear in the earth. Pieces of ground in jigsaw shapes moved up and down, tilted at all angles. He says, as I started to climb the fence to my neighbor's yard, the fence disappeared. Trees were falling in crazy patterns. Deep chasms 
cushioned the impact. I was on the verge of a quick burial. I could not pull my right arm from the sand. It was buried to the shoulder. Most of the rest of my body was also covered. And then he says, I was still holding on to my trumpet. Until then, I had to let go of the trumpet, and my arm was able to be pulled free easily. Dr. Lee goes on and he says, Too often our trumpets are the expressions of our rights, our egos, our desire for recognition and reward, and other things that are important to us. But when we commit our way to the Lord, we commit ourselves, but we learn to live, if necessary, without the trumpets of our lives, those things that we have counted so important. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, to learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Dr. Lee says, it may take an earthquake upheaval to pry us loose from the trumpets, those things that are too important in our lives, but it is the only way that will lead to the rest that Jesus promises to the soul. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We ask your blessing upon those who are watching and listening. And Lord, whoever and whatever they may be going through, uh, Lord, we just pray that they will learn to just hold their palm down and leave it and release it into your hands, your capable hands, trusting you, committing their whole lives to you. It's only in that kind of commitment that we will truly experience your deep peace. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. Amen. That uh, makes more sense. <laughs> Let me ask you, in starting our discussion on this tonight, what trumpet are you holding on to in your life? That's stopping God from having full control of your circumstances. It could be a tough one. I remember hearing a, a guy, he was in Bible college at that time. Oh no, oh no, he wasn't, he was already in the ministry, but in South Africa, he had been a very successful businessman very well-to-do, very prosperous businessman. And God, uh, and he felt he, this just wasn't for him. He felt he wanted to leave this all behind, all this lifestyle. He wanted to serve God. And he said, God, I'd even be willing to clean the toilets for you to go into your ministry. He did go into the ministry and became a, 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 a very successful pastor and but his first six months, he cleaned toilets. <laughs> God took sometimes. God will take us literally when we we talk to him about things. Are we willing to let go of that trumpet and let God have control? I think the only way you get that done is by realizing that these trumpets are blessings from God and. They're not something that you're going to need that in, in the next life, which is what you are basing this whole commitment on, is what's going to happen to maintain this. Yeah, you've you got to be, got to be able to separate that, and if they fall, they fall. There's nothing wrong with that. Yes. It's kind of like uh, get a kick out of a if you watch the news sometimes and there's forest fires and stuff going on. And here's a guy out there in the forest, he's gonna save his house with a with a garden hose. Yes. It, you know, he's not gonna do a lot of good. So it's it's you know, you gotta realize how ridiculous the situations are that these some of these gifts are. Right. Right. Any other thoughts? Sometimes it can be a really good thing that you're holding on to. It could be. But it's not what God wants. But it's not a God thing. 
a book called Shattered Dreams, and there he said, sometimes God shatters our dreams, our smaller dreams, so that he in turn can show us, um, what did he say, so we can realize his dream for us, our lives. <clears throat> and his dream is so much bigger than our little dreams, even if our little dreams are good. And then he said, so very often, <coughs> excuse me, um, God will show you his big dream and then he restores that little dream as well. But once you get the perspective right. All right. Very good. I think hard prophets <coughs> should be crying. Yes. Because sometimes our pride, whatever it is that we have, doesn't allow us to do what God yeah. thinks. God wants us to do, yeah. and it's not, once we get over that, you know, we can get our pride out of the way, then we, he uses us, but he can't use us as long as we have that fence of pride and prayer. Now, even that he's studying, what are you studying now? Theology. Yeah, and that was one of the things that he was talking about, because when we're prideful, we want to do what we want to do, not what God wants yeah. us to do. And then the studies that we have, it does say that, you know, when you start to do God's work, you usually have to do, like, cleaning up the toilets and that kind of the little stuff before you get into more of God's work. You know what I kind of had to realize over the last couple of weeks? Um, <clears throat> the power and the importance of, of fellowship um, and how... I just think as a Christian, or when you don't have that, I honestly believe you open yourself up to vulnerabilities, to spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in that place. Um, so it was a real hard day, and I'm praying real hard, right? But up until this point, I've always taken God as... Um, um, out, um, like when Jesus was on earth, disciples could go to lunch with them, they could, you know, knock on the door, and, and they could do all of that. I never had the opportunity to recognize that we can still do that. Um, and <clears throat> for me, the way that we do it was when I was praying so hard about I'm being attacked with dark thoughts, I'm being attacked with pain, I'm being attacked with all of this, and I committed. And I said, Jesus, I need for you to speak to me, but it, it can't be abstract. I have to know what do I do and how do I handle it. I... He spoke to my heart, and what he said is, you fill yourself with me to the point there is no room. Yes. And you know, I just sat there, and I couldn't even breathe. And to, uh, truly, I just sat there, just breathless, going, God is real. He speaks. But you do have to be willing to make that commitment to hear him. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry that it took the deprivation of fellowship, which is just a horrible thing, um, in order for me to get desperate enough to say, No, God, I'm alone. I need your voice. Yes. And he gave it to me. Isn't that amazing? I am so excited about this study. I really am. I'm just so excited. Beautiful. You know, it's just, it's an amazing thing. So anyhow, I'm talking too much. And no, never. <laughs> I call it a Lydia. No, I'm talking too much. <laughs> but yes, it's been, yes. It was amazing. It was a... Uh, there was a pogrom on the road, and uh, he was trying to find. Oh, hang on, I've got the wrong one. But this guy was trying to get close to Jesus, and he was speaking to a, a, a spiritual leader, 
and they were walking down the road and there was a some water there and this 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 teacher took him and grabbed him and stuck his head under the water and held him there and he was kicking and going man he came up there gasping for he says what are you doing he says when you look for the need Jesus as much as you needed air there you'll find him and basically like you say you've got to empty yourself you know it, it, it's a desperation yes that you reach out and say nothing else only you the missionary's wife in India that was having a, had a sick son and she said Lord I'm not leaving this room until I get an answer he said the answer is next to you yeah rejoice yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry Go no, go ahead. Go. I was going to say, as parents, we go through the same thing that God does. Because I know my children, we were grateful. They were, when I had a lot of businesses when they were growing up. So to them, they still think in that format. But they're very grateful. And I, my daughter's kind of open and out. She's come and asked me to do some sewing for her. You know, and I'm glad to do things for them, but they have to open up. And that's the way God is with us. You know, we, we have to open up in order for Him to be able to communicate with us. And that's kind of what brought me, when I seen her coming to ask for help, I realized that that's what we do with God sometimes, we just don't open up. Yes. And God is saying, I'm not going to take the, the next, most of the time God says, I'm not taking the problem from you, but I'll be with you in the problem and help you deal with it. And we ask him to take it away from me. What did he say to, to, to the Apostle Paul? He said, I had this thorn in my side and I asked God to take it away from me. And he said, my grace is good enough for you and to help you through with it. Is that what you, the line of thought you were saying? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. And there's a couple of things that I just wanted to mention. Um, I knew a man that was in Bible school in South Africa and sorry a lot of my examples come from South Africa because I spent my early Christian years there and 23 years in the Church of the Nazarene in South Africa. Uh, he was a national name in the building industry. Everybody knew him. You know, he was really and God called him to the ministry. He came to Bible College, left a place where everybody knew him to a place where nobody knew him and he was just a student. And somebody and his wife took a job at the Bible College as like the administrator at the college. And he says he one day he heard somebody talk and said, Who's that new guy? He says, Oh, he's the matron's wife. A uh, matron's husband. And he said what a realization for him. He had to let go of that trumpet. And he was no longer the big guy. He was a student. He was just the matron's husband. So I we have to get that where we can let go and say, these things I thought were important. These positions I thought were important. That income I thought was important. When Brenda and I were praying in South Africa, when my time was coming to the end of my career with the one company after 23 years and I knew I needed another job and it, it, it was an important one I was asking God to open a door for me and nothing was opening in South Africa because I was only asking for South Africa. The agent said to me, we have demand in other areas, especially America for that skill set. And Brendan and I really battled, but we prayed and we, really, we led it to God. Our trumpet was South Africa. Mm -hmm. Our trumpet was our family. Our trumpet was our church in South Africa. It, it, everything there that, you know, that we were comfortable with. And God said, let go of that trumpet and I'll open the door. And he did. And we never, in this case, it was not restored to us. We still have contact with our family, but... But once we let go of the trumpet of what we thought it should be, of where it should fit in, God opened the door for us. 
Well, if you don't let go of the trumpet, I think you're just going to have to start this whole cycle over and 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 over. Don't get through to you. Right. Oh, you're drowned with it. Oh, you're drowned with it. And the bad part of it is that you're holding on to something good. But last week we touched on admit and commit being you know, part of the same thing, because if you have is, uh, if you have issues, you know, say I, say there's some kind of sin in your life or some kind of weakness that you just just get you down or whatever. Until you admit that you have problems and issues and things and things in your life, you can't commit it to God if you're not willing to admit that you have a problem in the first place. Um, an addict cannot get help until they admit they've got a problem and they are an addict and they are addicted to what's causing the problem until they get to that point nobody can help them I don't think that could be that sometimes we ask God for you know whatever we ask him for um, or we want to be part of you know of this life but we get impatient yes mm -hmm. and we start thinking about it's not going to happen before it even happens and all of negative thoughts, or they just give up. So it's just how we feel towards letting him do his job. Like I know when I get, I get impatient with what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but for the most part I'm glad that I'm alive. You're right. Because that's, that's the first thing that was going to mm -hmm. happen. It was, I was just going to go. And I was going to lose my leg, and I just said, God, you know, you know what you have to do or what I have to go through. That was painful and still is, but I know that he's going to do what he's going to do. Whether I like it or not, it's not my choice. <laughs> and I know he's putting up, put me through a test. And I was a very prideful person, very independent. You know, I did what I wanted. I, I was always kind of like ambitious. I had to make money no matter what. And he's put me in a position now where we have the right amount of money for our lifestyle. But sometimes it, like, that thought comes back, so I have to kind of push it away and see you know, where you got us, where you want us. And, mm -hmm. and it's hard. At first, it's hard, but once we decide to let God let go, that's why I have it there on the door like that, that, to remind me that that's what I have to do. And so far, we made it here, what, three years now, going on four? Three years. Yeah. In spite of the fact that we have to spend a lot of money on my medical stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now look is it because of the grass they're charging us. The insurance only covers so much and we have to pay the rest. But um this leg's already healed. But I hit it with a chair in the office so having a new new thing. Oh. And he kept telling me, Don't go in the office, don't do this, don't do this but somebody's gotta pay the bill. So I went in there and I got up and somehow I hit the chair. But it's already it already had healed. And this one here, the wounds were smaller, so but it's hard for me. I want to take over, and I have to let God do whatever He's going to do. Right. Brenda okay. and I, when I went on retirement, cut my salary in half of what I was used to getting. Mm -hmm. We had to learn to live within our means. We had to learn we couldn't do what we used to do. Yeah. We had to learn to trust God. And I thank God for everything I have. I thank God for the house. I thank God for all. But we have to learn to, to, to do it. And somehow we started here was we had to buy new furniture and stuff for the yeah. house. The table couldn't find one, so my daughter threw it away. We picked it up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we have so much more than what we started. Yes. Where it's coming from, or, you know, but we do. Yes. I have so much, and then I still have stuff in my other house. I probably don't even remember what I have. But he's taking care of us. I'm kind of, I, I like what you just said about patience. Uh, a lack of patience doesn't even sometimes allow you to uh, open the door all the way to look into the room. You'll take a quick glance through the crack of the door and uh, shut it right away because... If you know what you want. Yeah, it's not, you didn't bother to look very hard either. But yeah, you got to have patience to uh, to uh, open up. And then you open up, then you can commit. 
it's a it's, it's a hard one to get started on. The, the first base is going to be is awfully hard to get there. Yes, and we spoke about commit, and then it goes to. Oh. We spoke about commit, and then it goes to trust. And as we commit, we need to learn to trust that what he's doing is the right thing, and that he will look after us. And and you say you might open doors. That's not quite what I'm used to, you know. God is calling us to to things that are beyond our imagination and blessings beyond our imagination. Yeah, there's a lot of things we, we forget. And I think the big one is that everything comes in a lot of different makes and models and years and uh, styles and colors and everything else. So it's uh, when you open that door, it might not be what you're used to, but exactly, it's, it's very similar. <laughs> yeah. the, it might just be the the real deal. Yes. No, because we I have several houses, but the thing is, we have association that kind of stuff when we start doing that matter. But for some reason, God put us here because we're at the age now that we can't maintain a lot of stuff. Yes. And we still have a lot of stuff, but. <laughs> He doesn't go maintain the other what the house we were living in had a lot of trees and yards and all that and he was getting to the point where he just couldn't do it anymore. He he tried, but I could tell that yeah. he could totally exhaust it. And so that's and then I didn't know that I was gonna get in this position. You know, I started to get sick a long time ago, but I didn't know what I had, I just thought I was tired. Then I ignored it. And so but when my mom was staying with us, that's when I started feeling my legs going really bad. Yeah, uh, watching my mom go through her stuff helped me get to what I'm going through mm -hmm. now. Knowing that she was in the wheelchair, she could do a lot of things and stuff like that. And now I know why God put her in my life to help her. Because he knew I was going to go through what I'm going through now. And that's giving me the strength to get going. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing you said as well, is God knows beforehand what's coming. I was very unhappy when I retired because it was too early for me. I had plans to work till I was 70, but my house would not have allowed it, and God knew it. Um, certain things came up, but you know, it wasn't expected. So, can we trust Him? We will talk on trust next week, but can we commit knowing that God knows? I would say He does, we just don't pay attention a lot of times to the things He puts in front of us. There's always a reason. I always believe that there's always a reason for something happening. Yes. You just gotta stick to it. Well, committing is preparing to mm -hmm. uh, right. yourself for, you know, like what you said. That we can't. We're at that age now where we can't do all this stuff that we used to do. But I think God allows us that as we do grow older. That commitment, the trust is preparation and you can with preparation and prayer you can get it along yes anybody have a testimony along these lines how God has helped you in a situation you, you just couldn't believe it I mean you know as you look back and you committed something well, I know when my husband was sick and they had told me that it was only going to last about six weeks at the most. That was the most heartbreaking thing for me. So all I did was pray and then sleeping with him next to him, not knowing whether he was going to wake up alive or not. That was the hardest thing yes. I went through. But through prayer and prayer and prayer and when he finally went back to the doctor the third time I believe he said, that it was a miracle. He told me it's a miracle that he's that whatever he had is God. He said you need to pray for whatever your God is or you know your spiritual. He said a spiritual person, and uh, that right there I knew that he probably wasn't a Christian. But I think it kind of woke him up too. Yes. And so we never know. And then, like when I went to get one of my procedures. Uh, because my card says, you know, I do Bible studies and that kind of thing. And so one of the ladies there that was not a Christian, I don't know if she committed or not, but she talked to the doctor that was taking care of me. 
And she said, what is this about, you know, the, the Bible studies and all that? So he said, him and his, one of the other guys sat down with her and talked to her about the Bible. So when I went back the next time and she was there taking care of I could tell the difference. I could tell the difference on her because she was asking me questions before about, like, cybernetics and stuff like that. Yes. But when I saw her the next time, she was more calm and kind of like she was more um, unsure of what she believed in and what she had learned. And so God works through us because that's why the doctor says that car that you gave us, God worked through you to get the information, you know, for us to be able to give her the information. And sometimes we don't know that, you know. I didn't go and talk to her, someone just because of my, they talked to her. God opened the door and you took it. <clears throat> I thank God for, it's almost December this year, I'll be a Christian 50 years, if I got saved. Um, hard to believe it so long already, but I, I look back on my life and I just see day after day, month after month, year after year, the miracles that God has performed, some small, some big. Um, the past five years was really tough on us, medically, work-wise, everything. God was there every step of the way. Same with us. Um, I'd say, going back a very, very long time ago, <laughs> when um, our oldest is now 46, <laughs> he, when he's, his first year in first grade, and we didn't have South Africa in those days, first grade was the beginning. You didn't have anything before then. It's no nursery school, no kindergarten, yeah. or nothing. First grade, he goes to school and his teacher said, uh, tells us, says, I think Jonathan has a problem. I think he has um, ADHD. Yeah. And so I said, yeah, you know, your heart sinks. Your first child going to school, okay, he has a problem. So, I mean, things progressed and eventually we had to take him for um, occupational therapy, which cost us money, which we didn't have, and that was God provided for us. But one day when I was praying, and I said, God, you've given us this child, he has these problems, and my very words were, God, what hope does he have, and what future is he going to have? And God said, I know the plans I have for Jonathan, plans to prosper him and not to harm him, plans to give him hope and a future. And I'm just like, wow, God, what more could I actually, what more could I want? What more can you give me? And just, it just gave me peace. Yeah, there we, I mean, his whole school life was a struggle. He couldn't homeschool, it was illegal to homeschool. At one stage they spoke about sending him into a, put him in a special school. And the principal said, no, don't do that. That's going to be far more harmful for him than just knowing that he's normal and maybe just getting through the year and things like that. And now, I mean, he's doing what every other person does. He has a family, he works, he, he teaches. And just, just think God. involved in his church. Yeah, and God answered that. Yes. And that was, he was a itty bitty little kid. Now let me ask you tonight. We have a lot of testimonies tonight, and we rejoice with the answers. Are you still battling with something that you need to commit to God? Can you trust God enough to commit? And if God is there, He wants to take care of it. And I, I, I encourage you to seek God's face and to seek His Word. And, and as Brenda and as, as Robin said, the Lord comes and He gives answers. You also had answers from God. Um, God has spoken to me on Sunday morning. We, the, a couple of guys in the church will be talking on Psalm 1. And that's a favorite passage of scripture to me because that was a time where I was battling and I'll be talking a bit about it at 
it's, it's true. But um, the time when I was battling my life and I wasn't sure of my direction, and God gave me someone and said, don't listen to the counsel of the ungodly or walk in the steps of, of the wicked or, you know, but meditate on my word day and night and you'll be like a tree planted by the river that will bear its fruit in a season and all you do will prosper. And I took that and I applied it and God blessed me through it. So he has it. He has those words for you. He has that encouragement and that we need to trust him and commit yeah, I guess God speaks to people in different ways because I don't hear God. It wasn't all I hear voices that directly. But mine come in dreams, like if there's an issue or something, and I start to worry, and I dream about it, not exactly how, whatever it is that I'm having, but there'll be a dream to show me, you know, what needs to be done or not done or whatever. And I dream almost every night. Or if I go up, you know, like if I go to bed and get up again at 4 and I go back to bed, I dream again. And when I take that medication that they gave me for the pain, I cannot remember my dreams, and I always remember my dreams. But I have to take it, because if I don't, I can't sleep. Like, I don't let him sleep, I should say. <laughs> God answers in many ways. Mm -hmm. My answers have always been through Scripture. But God answers through Scripture. He answers through visions. He answers through dreams. He answers through other children of God speaking to you. He has many ways that he answers. Yeah, my mom used to read the Bible a lot, and sometimes I dream, or I dream, I think I dream her every night. But she's talking to me about something in the Bible in Spanish. So I started doing my devotionals in Spanish. I guess she just, you know, I don't know. She just, she always talked to me about the Bible whenever we had coffee or anything like that. And I still dream her, like she's alive. I have started reading my Bible in my second language. The sole purpose is that you get to know, I got to know the word too well through my first language and sometimes it can just fly by the top of your head because you're so used to it. Whereas doing it in the second language I have to concentrate on what I'm reading and concentrate on what it's saying. And it's not as familiar and, and it's almost like God uses it because of my extra work in it, He uses it to talk to me. So just saying you were talking in Spanish, it's interesting. Okay, as we close tonight, um, we just want to thank you all for this time with us. Um, again, anybody that's um, watching online, we encourage you to, to, to go with us and read Psalm 37. Try and get hold of a copy of Early's book, the, um, the Cycle of Victorious Living. And if you need help and you need prayer and you need somebody to talk to, please feel free to send me a text message. My number is 714-474-4641. And we'll be glad to talk to you and to be with you. And we just thank God for this and we just commit everything to the Lord tonight as we close the study. In Jesus' name. Amen. We will yeah. talk again next week on chapter on the third chapter of the cycle, which is trust. Correct, Brenda? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.